Hello and good evening everyone. So today I thought I'd use the time to tell you all, uh, to talk to you all about something that has been in my mind for the past, we're talking four to five years, since the time when Opel was sold by General Motors to the PSA group, uh, which is now Stellantis. And, uh, and uh, um, basically I want to talk to you all about General Motors and in particular, why General Motors failed in Europe. Um, so basically, whatever I'm going to be explaining in this video will be based on my experience, my opinion, my opinion. <laughs> okay, jokes aside. Basically, whatever I'll be explaining in this video will be based on my experience, my opinion partially, but I promise I'll try not to be biased. Uh, but I, you know, I'll try to express things in a way of, uh, I'll try to speak more about facts, okay? Now, I'm going to warn you all in advance, I'm no statistician, but I am a car enthusiast. And as a car enthusiast, I have always been watching what every, you know, what, what most car manufacturers have been up to. So, like, whenever there's something new or some new trend out there, I always find out very quickly. Uh, basically, what I want to talk to you all is a topic that has been baffling me, and uh, it's about General Motors and why they left Europe. First, I'd like to start by talking about the nature of General Motors. General Motors is an American company and American companies are great when it comes to big machines. American companies, they innovate. In fact, they, they're the king of innovations. They have always innovated since the beginning. They've come up with technology and innovations that shook the automotive industry and that would provoke a new competition in the automotive industry. So American companies like Tesla, which forced the automotive industry to come up with electric cars. General Motors in particular, uh, they had lots of success uh, back in the 90s. Uh, actually, General Motors had the golden years back in the, the post-World War II until the 1970s. Those were the golden years for General Motors. Why? Because those were the times when General Motors was free to do what they needed to do. Uh, build cars as big as they had to be. They could do anything. That, in the 70s, 60s, you could basically build a car out of tin foil and no safety expert will say a thing about it. Or you could build a car out of gold or diamonds. No safety expert would judge you. Nobody's going to judge you. There was no such thing as safety at that time. You could do whatever you want. Um, and General Motors, basically, they were the king of those times. You know, those Cadillacs and everything, the land yachts. Oh, I love those Cadillacs of the 50s, I think. No, 60s. But my most, the most favorite car I, I really like, guys, of General Motors, and this was in 1949, is the Buick Roadmaster. Oh, I love the Buick Roadmaster. I would like to talk to you all about the nature of General Motors. General Motors has had a curse of never being able to do a small car. Something like an A-segment car. So when we're talking A-segment car, we're talking like something to compete against a Volkswagen Up, a Fiat 500, or a Toyota Ego. Something like that, okay? General Motors never found success in coming with, up with a B-segment car. So something like a Toyota Yaris, Volkswagen Polo, or you name it. Uh, Volkswagen even, uh, and General Motors never even had success coming up with a C-segment car, something to compete against the Toyota Corolla, Volkswagen Golf, Opel Astra. Well, actually, okay, actually Opel was with General Motors, so, but I'll come to that later. Let's just talk about the General Motors perspective of things. General Motors never found success with small cars. Uh, they found success in North America for obvious reasons because they were the king of big cars and the North American market has high demand for big vehicles. But in Europe, the demand was contrary. So, General Motors sought to find some help from a South Korean company that goes by the name Daewoo, something like that. Um, but it didn't end very well because, you see, General Motors has made many attempts to compete in the small car segment and each of those attempts failed. Uh, 
they, they were coming up with small cars that were just drab, something that were not very special to drive because uh, here in Europe, competitors were offering something either better value for money and something more interesting and something that had more identity to it. And this was something General Motors lacked. Now I'm going to talk to you all about Opel because I hear many of you right now telling me that, dude, what are you talking about? General Motors owned Opel. They actually had success in Europe at one point. You are all correct. They did own Opel, as a matter of fact. They did have success, but Opel was suffering just as badly as General Motors was uh, back in the 90s and 2000s. Opel had a curse for never having an identity, and to this day, it's a very big mystery why. They always suffered the same problem as the Asian brands did. Asian uh, car manufacturers suffered the problem of lacking identity, but being super reliable. Opel, on the other hand, suffered a complete identity issue. They had no specialization in anything. Nobody knew what Opel specialized at, actually. The, back in the 80s, Opel had the reliability on their side, but that was logic because back in the 80s, 90s, even in the 70s, everything was mechanical. But as years progressed, like in the 2000s, things became more electronic because of demand, and because of safety systems, and because of safety regulations, well, safety laws, you know, new things, new trends, uh, and uh, new traffic rules. Um, and so therefore, Opel, did suffer for a bit on reliability because that's that that's when everything became more computerized and such um uh, and and general motors also did suffer in that regard uh, on reliability that was in the 2000s the 2000s was a horrible era for the automotive industry i've noticed and general motors was one of the victims and that equally meant opel uh opel had quality issues also in the 2000s but i feel like the golden years, again, for General Motors was in the mid-2010s, just before they sold Opel to the PSA Group, guys. Just when everything was going back to the way it should have been. So, between 2014 to 2017, things were going back on track. Everything was going smoothly again. Opel was coming up with desirable models. They had the Insignia. I'm a very big fan of the Opel Insignia, but I don't know. Now, the future of the Insignia remains a question because I just, I just don't know what Stellantis is going to do. But hey guys, that's Stellantis' decision. If they decide this, well, I guess they have a valid reason. I mean, they're the ones who do the homework. They're the ones who see the statistics. They are the ones who ask the customer what is it they want. So, you know, I did warn you all I'm not a statistician, right? But anyways, back to topic everyone. So, Opel, uh, just when Opel was about to get everything right, uh, General Motors basically sold Opel to the PSA Group. Now, the reason why General Motors had to do this is because for a long time, General Motors had some... Well, from what I recall, General Motors has had a curse of having trial and error constantly. They always had some project, but they had to kill the projects. General Motors had one problem, and that is they never stuck to one thing. They keep changing things. And that's because of, of something, okay? Some bureaucracy or something about the management. There's always something going on with General Motors. But now I want to move on to the next part about why General Motors failed in the EU market. Another reason why General Motors failed in the EU market is because the EU market is already full of powerful competitors. The EU market is the home of the Volkswagen Group. By now, we all are aware the Volkswagen Group own Volkswagen. Okay, so this is the Volkswagen Group, right? Over here, Volkswagen Group. Underneath is other car brands. So they own Volkswagen. They own Audi, they own Skoda, they own Seat, and then they also own ultra luxury brands. So Porsche, Bugatti, and then they also own some non-car brands. So brands that work on trucks like Mann and Scania. Scania, that's how we say it in Swedish. Scania, yeah, that's it. And then they also own uh, Neoplan. 
Neoplan is a bus manufacturer company. As you can tell, Volkswagen Group has massive things going on across Europe. They even own Ducati, guys. These the Volkswagens is like the genius here in Europe. And General Motors basically had to put up a fight with Volkswagen here in the EU market. And they just couldn't. Because Volkswagen had the quality on their side. And this meant every Volkswagen product, every Volkswagen car. Volkswagen has had a blessing of doing cars that have great quality, desirability, very rich identity, and especially luxury cars. In the luxury segment, Volkswagen has had so much success that even at General Motors' home in North America, Volkswagen is almost, in my opinion, they seem like just as dominant as General Motors' luxury brand, like Cadillac. In the luxury segment, Volkswagen is very dominant. Uh, but like if not in Europe, if not, okay, in Europe, in the luxury segment, Volkswagen group cars are dominant, like Audi and Porsche and Bugatti. Uh, in North America, you be the judge, everyone, because I think Cadillac still has a very big name in North America and especially Lincoln, although I haven't heard from Lincoln in a while. Um, but across the world, like in the Asian market, in the African market, in the Australasian market, in the South American market, you be the judge, but me, I think that Volkswagen still has quite a big name when it comes to the luxury segment, along with Mercedes and BMW. Uh, but uh, aside from luxury segment, let's get back to the big picture about the EU market and competition over here as to why General Motors failed. General Motors failed in Europe also because of competition. They didn't have what it takes to defeat the EU market competitors. They didn't have what it takes to tackle the EU market competitors. Another prominent competitor would be the PSA group, Peugeot Citroën. Peugeot Citroën have had a reputation for doing one of the best small cars in the automotive industry. Now, it's true they never had reliability on their side, but they did have the desirability and they did have the driving pleasure. I, I'm a Citroen fan, as you can tell, and I love Citroen cars. Well, new ones are a bit questionable, but I'm talking about the ones from the 2000s, the 90s, the 80s, the 70s. I love their cars. Um, and they, and the PSA group were the king of small cars, and General Motors could barely defeat them. The, the French, they dominate the small segment, the small car segment, along with the Volkswagen group. And General Motors could not tackle them. They just couldn't. Volkswagen had quality on their side. They had the Volkswagen Golf, the Volkswagen Polo. Another thing I'd like to remark is that in the EU market, European brands have very strong identity and specialization in something. So each and every European brand has something which they are known for. So, for example, Volvo is the king of safety. Uh, BMW is the one that specializes in driving pleasure and etc. Okay, the list can go on forever. But General Motors never had anything to specialize at. They always sold cars in, here in Europe, which they would never sell in the USA. Like they were giving us all the small basic models, which had no in, no specialization. They were like just those basic sponge cakes you'd buy for two euros at uh, your local store. Uh, it's like going to Walmart and buying yourself those cheap cakes they sell for two dollars and that's that's just vanilla sponge and you eat it and it doesn't have any taste. That's basically what General Motors was selling here in Europe. Whereas in America, they were selling the big guns, they were selling the big cool cars. It seems like General Motors neglected the EU market. They, they really were focused on the North American market and then also equally some specialized parts of the world. So there's like certain parts of the world where General Motors was focused on because of high demand. Thing to remark about competition in the EU market is that uh, the reason why General Motors lost in the EU market wasn't necessarily because of European competitors alone. There are giant competitors that also are quite prominent in the EU market. So competitive giants like Toyota, the Japanese giant guys, Toyota and Nissan and Honda. Well, okay, let's start with Toyota. 
Toyota is a Japanese giant that basically dominates the globe, that dominates the entire world. Uh, the only reason Toyota has basically survived this long is because they have reliability on their side and Toyota has a very good business strategy. Volkswagen's business strategy was expansion through purchases of other brand. Toyota's business strategy was to do one thing and stick to it religiously until the end. And that has proved successful. So Toyota has reliability on their side and they stuck to it. They make their cars properly so that they roll from A to B without parts falling off. That was the reputation Toyota has and they still have it to this day. Uh, and if you don't trust Toyota, or if you feel like they're unreliable, they have the reliable five-year warranty to back them up. So it's like a tank, you cannot question it. The only time you, qu you can question it is when the warranty expires. Then only you can be like, oh my gosh. <laughs> but you be the judge. Anyways, back to topic. Uh, <clears throat> Toyota started the hybrid technology. Toyota has been the only brand that's actually made the hybrid technology since a very long time. They started in 1992, I think. Some, I know they started in the 1990s, that's for sure. And to this day, they actually nailed it. They came up with a very modernized hybrid technology that's reliable, guys. A modernized version that's very reliable. To this day, many brands have a curse for still not coming up with a reliable hybrid technology. And this curse lies particularly amongst some European brands, unfortunately. And the American brands... I mean, the question is, did the Americans ever have hybrid technology to begin with? Because I, I'm, I'm sure in North America they have hybrid technology, but here in the EU market, they never actually sold any hybrid car. Or if they did, they only did it at the very last stage, like when it's too late now. Because now, in today's generation, everyone wants electric cars, so now it's too late to offer any hybrid. And if they do offer hybrid, they do it in an illogic manner. They just, you know, because they're giving hybrid on a car that's got a huge engine to it. So I recently saw this uh, Ford Edge, no, wait, Ford Explorer, yeah. I recently saw this Ford Explorer. Uh, it comes with a plug-in hybrid, but it comes with a huge engine of like 3.5, it's a three liter engine. I'm not sure what size the engine was, but I'm pretty sure it was around three liters, guys. And it just, it's not logic. Here in the EU market, to have a hybrid with a three liter engine makes no sense whatsoever, guys. So uh, that's one thing, guys. And another thing is, uh, reliability, the Japanese have the reliability and the, some of the other competitors did not. That's why Toyota is quite dominant in the EU market. They offer cars that are reliable and good value for money. Well, they used to be good value for money, then for some time they were quite expensive, but now they're coming back to being good value for money. Uh, and then also you have other giants like Nissan. Now, Nissan has survived in the EU market uh, compared to General Motors because they have an alliance with Geno. And this alliance has proven to Nissan financially successful, uh, a big financial success for Nissan. Nissan succeeded, they survived. And uh, they also have, you know, uh, they, they have an alliance with Renault and they still have an identity of their own. They still have some niche models that they're selling in Europe as I'm speaking, like the Nissan GTR, the Nissan Navara, although there have been developments and sources uh, stating that the Navara is going to be discontinued in Europe, which is unfortunate, but environmental initiatives, guys. Uh, but now there are also uh, electric models like the Nissan Leaf, which is selling like hot, which is selling like hot cakes at the moment, guys. Ooh. Very big respect for Nissan over there. Congratulations. And then you have uh, the last uh, Japanese giant like Honda. Well, Honda isn't very... I feel like Honda is on its last legs on the European market, but they're only surviving thanks to the Civic and the CRV. Otherwise, I felt like for some time Honda was actually on its last leg, but now they have some really promising models that just came out, guys. Like the Honda E and the Honda HRV, the new one that's due to come out. And uh, at least Honda never gave up. That's one thing I have to applaud Honda for. So good job, Honda. Thank you for having faith in us. Also, I want to talk about a South Korean giant, Hyundai, guys. The Hyundai group. So Hyundai and Kia, they both have stepped up big time in the EU market thanks to being good value for money, guys. There was a time they suffered from quality issues but then they climbed their way up, guys. They, they really dominated the EU market thanks 
to being great value for money and also more desirable, like the Kia Sorento guys. I don't know what is it about the uh, General Motors, but General Motors could barely achieve anything. They, they couldn't be good value for money, like the South Korean brands like Hyundai. They couldn't be reliable like the Japanese. They couldn't be stylish like the Italian brands. They couldn't be qualitative like Volkswagen. So the question that lies over here is, what could General Motors do in the EU market? <clears throat> now, I want to cover the topic about uh, environmental initiatives executed in the EU market. Now, uh, across the EU market, there have been many strong initiatives towards the environment. Um, so this automatically meant car brands had to make promises to come up with hybrid solutions. So hybrid cars or plug-in hybrid cars or even fully electric cars. And also in the future, there could be hydrogen fuel cell cars because I know Toyota and Hyundai offer hydrogen fuel cell at the moment. Um, General Motors had something going on, I remember. I think it was, I'm not sure it was if, if it was an electric car they had, but I know the Chevrolet Vault existed. It sold here at Belgium at one point, but it didn't sell like hotcakes, but it did sell here at one point. Um, and then also you had the Opel Ampera. Yeah, Opel Ampera. Uh, I have no idea what, exa what exactly went on guys because for some reason they achieved no fame at all no success um very mysterious what exactly has been going on because they had some really promising models uh, well in my view they looked promising the Chevrolet vault looked promising and the opel ampera looked very promising but both of them never found success i don't know no, i do not know why guys i really do not know why uh, because here in the eu market we have a high demand for quality and also we have a high demand for for great value for money and performance guys performance was also key and uh, driving range when it comes to plugins and uh, you know plug-in hybrids or electric cars what is the range you can drive at and it seems like these cars could not satisfy the customers these cars just didn't meet the expectations i don't know about the rest of europe but i know here in belgium there have been an increase on taxes for diesel engines and especially those that have been registered under private names. So, you know, that automatically penalizes anyone who registers a big diesel engine under, under private names. So, it, it, it leaves General Motors very little options for success. It's like General Motors could barely do anything now at, in Europe. Um, General Motors, they, because General Motors is the king of big cars and Europe has the opposite demand. They don't need, they, the EU market does not demand a colossal car. They demand a qualitative car that can drive from A to B and that is reliable and good value for money. And this is something General Motors could never achieve. It's a curse they have. They could never achieve this before. Um, so, yes. Uh... Now, it is possible to still import General Motor vehicles into Europe through uh, uh, some means. Uh, garages. There's some garages here in Belgium and I'm sure across Europe that uh, specialize in importing uh, American cars. So cars that have American specs on them or cars that are built in North America and that have been imported to Europe uh, on special demands. So sometimes they're imported for uh, diplomatic missions, sometimes they're imported by American expats, or sometimes they're just simply imported by local citizens, like perhaps a Belgian who is, Im who is obsessed with American cars. But sometimes it's also for professional purposes, because I noticed here in Belgium, uh, whenever people drive American pickup trucks like the Dodge Ram, I've seen some do, some of them do really uh, hard work with them. So like, I've seen them pull heavy trailers. I've seen them pull construction equipment. So I guess they use them not just for the show, but for real use. Like they actually do travel a lot. They actually do a lot of work with them. Um, and I think that's important. So I guess this, they need to because 
here in the EU market, you cannot just have a car for the, the fun of it. You, you really need to, the, in the EU market, there's also an expectation that you use your car specifically what it's designed to do. You cannot just own a car for the pleasure of it. Uh, and the tax laws have made sure of that. So, so 18 year olds out there, you want to get your dream car, your Dodge Ram or Ford Mustang, V8 engine, right? Yeah, well, say goodbye to your dream cars because there's a chance you're gonna be paying a high tax for that. Trust me, you want a nice, cheap Citroen. It, I, I, I would have done that if I were you, okay? 18 years old. I have to confess, I, yeah, you know, I was always into big cars. I was never very much a small car fanboy until I actually drove a small car myself. So here's my conclusion about why General Motors failed in the EU market. They failed in the EU market because they failed to stick to their obligations. They failed to stick to their guns. They, they never had balance going on. They never had like... Like usually most brands, when they start a project, they stick to it for long, especially here in the EU market. Here in the EU market, there's high demand for reputation. People love brands that have a reputation. People love Chevrolet here in Belgium. People love Cadillacs because they have a reputation. But unfortunately, the reason why we don't buy them is because there's so little of them available. And then also, if we want to buy a Cadillac or if we want to buy a Chevrolet, they all come with massive engines that upset the taxes. So therefore, we're forced to look at competitor brands which are European and which build the, the, their vehicles here in Europe. So that automatically reduces import costs and everything. Um, and, and also, you see, that's the thing that I, I feel like General Motors lost interest in the EU market. And it's not that they wanted to lose interest in the EU market. It's simply because they were just busy. Life just got busy. You know, it's like they just distanced themselves. They, they focused on the North American market. Uh, and I wonder how successful that has become for them. And the, Chi the Chinese market has also become of high demand around the, Euro in the, around the world. And Volkswagen has also been very dominant in the Chinese market. And recently Stellantis has also been picking up some activity over there. General Motors has been actually doing some great work over there in the Chinese market. But I'm starting to feel like in the Chinese market, General Motors is also getting a bit of company. <laughs> like General Motors, best of luck trying to survive there now because in the Chinese market, there's going to be uh, the Volkswagen group cars that are going to, you know, start taking your customers and Stellantis is now becoming a thing over there, especially with the DS automobiles. Oh yes, you heard me guys, DS automobiles the luxury brand of the PSA group. That's that guys, uh, competitors, environmental initiatives, and simply the nature of General Motors guys, their curse of never being able to just do a small car. Small cars are actually more powerful than you think when it comes to business. Uh, because when you think of a successful business, you have to think of simplicity, something simple. You have to start from something simple. Start with something simple, something just basic and build on it from there build on it from there general motors started from here they started here in the eu market back in the well i think general motors earned fame here in europe particularly after world war ii that's when you started seeing all those luxury cadillacs and land yachts here in the european market that's when everyone was like wow general motors is certainly here but General Motors had a curse of never being able to do a small car and that was obvious guys They just never could do a small car because it's American and in North America There just isn't any demand for small cars um, The only place in North America I can see high demands of small cars would be in the heart of Manhattan in like New York City or even Miami, Florida um, I know the Fiat 500 has been selling like hotcakes around the USA though for some reason and uh, Congratulations Stellantis Fiat 500 for days, but it's just that General Motors, they tried some things and they failed because they tried to do it through collaborations. Uh, I vividly remember this thing going on with Daewoo. It went horribly wrong, guys. Like, I don't know what General Motors was thinking doing uh, that with Daewoo. Basically, they had some Chevrolet cars that were rebatched Daewoo's and 
underpowered, not desirable, and just embarrassing to be driving in. It's just, no, 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 no. It's like even the French were doing something more desirable than that. I mean, I would rather drive a Citroen C3 than driving in a Daewoo, especially for something that costs, what, uh, less than 10,000 euros? If I had to choose something less than 10,000 euros, just buy yourself a Citroen C1 or a Peugeot 108. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and stay tuned for more videos that are on the run. Uh, now, uh, I just want to say I apologize if I talk too much, first of all, if I go into too much uh, tangents. And I also want to apologize if this topic uh, offended anyone in any way possible, because uh, I really do not mean to offend anyone, okay? I just meant to express my opinion and my thought. It's a topic that has been in my mind for the past five years, and I just thought I'd finally let it out because I'm just baffled, okay? I really miss General Motors. I really wish they could come back to Europe and be a good competitor like they once was. We need a true American. So far, the only true American we have is Stantis, which is basically Jeep and Chrysler rebadged cars or something. But I don't know. They have their own thing going on. They, they have their own thing going on. I mean, I just, I'm not a big fan of Jeep, to be honest. But hey, I, I still respect them for trying. And now we have Ford that's introducing North American models here in Europe, like the Ford Explorer, which was a big surprise. But then at the same time, gosh, that thing is so huge for the EU market. They still have not come up with a small engine. I mean, that's the thing, guys. Americans are obsessed with huge engines. They just cannot come up with a 1.5 hybrid petrol. <laughs> but it's okay. I'm sorry. Americans watching this video, you have to know something. I love American cars. You guys are amazing. But it's just, come on. I really, we, we here in the, in the Belgian market, we really want something that's, you know, cheap to tax. I'm sorry. We have like high taxes going on here. So, you know. But hey, Americans, just, just so you know, we Belgians love the Ford Mustang Mach-E. I mean, especially me, I love the Ford Mustang mach -E. Thank you. Oh, and we love the Ford Mustang too. I mean, who doesn't love the Ford Mustang? I mean, perhaps I don't, but yeah, just, I'm more of a luxury person. Like I'm more into luxury cars. I'm not really much of a muscle car person. <laughs> okay, bye.